Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Faulkner Gallery at the Central Library. My name is Jen Lemberger, and I am the programming librarian here at the Central Library. Uh, and I get to work with the League of Women Voters on this series of civic forums that we have monthly. Uh, if you did not know, this is, I just said, a monthly series that we do from September to May. They're generally at noon. Sometimes we have them in the evening, but generally at noon, the third Thursday of, every, third Wednesday. Whew. Still not quite sure what day it is after the holidays. Uh, the third Wednesday of every month, so you can always join us and know that we will have a topic of interest to our community that we will be talking about. Um, and on the topic of civics, we're always so pleased to have these events here at the library. Trusted institution, proven um, to have the trust of our community members as we provide information and great books to read. Uh, if you are interested in hearing about more events such as these civic forums um, or our social justice book club, which is meeting Tuesday the 21st at 6, or upcoming screenings such as A Fear Screen Fire, which is a documentary about the environmental movement that we're hosting with Arts and Lectures, Census 2020 info, and any other other things related to civics. We do have a specific, a specific library newsletter that is just about our civics engagement here at the library. <clears throat> so you can sign up for that. I'll pass it around. It's a little clipboard. Just need your name and your email or just your email. That's fine. Um, and it is once a month, just sort of sending out events, volunteer opportunities, and info that are related to civics and civic engagement here in our community. So I encourage you all to sign up for that. Um, as well, you can see some of you on your seats. You have recommended reading lists. Um, these we compile for all of our adult events related to the topics that we have at our events. So you have one today that is related to incarceration in America. If you're interested in those books, if you actually just walk into the library, one of the very first shelves has a display up that includes all of these books as well as many others. So you can actually just go in right after this forum and browse those books to see if anything catches your eye. Um, and it's always great to have further reading, further information um, to be able to engage and act in our civic society. So please engage in that way as well. And with that, I will introduce um, the president of the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara, um, who will bring us into this afternoon's panel, Vijay Jamalamadaka. Well so close. <laughs> It's a difficult name. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you to Jen and the Santa Barbara Public Library for co-sponsoring this forum with us. Um, so today's forum is thought-provoking, the high cost of incarceration, an expensive failure. No question mark, just an expensive failure. Um, I have a few announcements to make for the League and then we do thank yous, and then we will introduce our moderator. So um, we are sad to announce that we have recently lost two longtime members at the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara. Connie Hanna, some of you may know her, uh, and Susan Shank, who have designated our League for any tribute donations that members may wish to make. And our membership table is near the entrance. Please support us, join us as a member. We have two follow-up discussions to continue the conversation on this topic. So on uh, January 24th, uh, we'll meet for lunch at Dargan's and there will be a, a conversation led by Pam Flint Tambo. And then the supper discussion group, which generally meets uh, on, uh, we'll be meeting um, at F Madame Lou's uh, on February 4th, but we have a conflict because our league is actually uh, sponsoring a candidate forum for the Assembly District 37, seven, seven candidates, and all of them have said yes, and that will take place on February 4th uh, at the Carpentria City Hall that same night. So we've changed the discussion group for Madame Luz on this topic to uh, February 8th, um, RSVP, 18th, sorry, thank you. February 18th, and please RSVP to Karen Bunker. 
Uh, we have other candidate forums too. On January 30th, we have the County Supervisor District 1 Forum here at 6 p.m. at the Faulkner. And then on February 6th, we have the County Supervisor District 3 Forum at the Goleta Valley Community Center at 6 p.m. Please see the flyers at the door. You can take one uh, on your way out. Um, our next Civic Forum will be on February 19th. And it's exciting, this year, the League uh, of Women Voters is celebrating our 100th birthday. And so it's uh, February 14th is the actual day, but uh, we're celebrating it on February 19th, the third Thursday of the forum over here. And we're excited to tell you that our speaker will be Carolyn Jefferson Jenkins, the first and only an African-American woman to be president of the U.S. League of Women Voters. And she will speak about the untold story of women of color in the League of Women Voters. And she'll be introduced by our current U.S. president, Chris Carson, and uh, we will follow it up with an equality party. So, <laughs> so don't miss that one. Um, please read our email updates and check our website calendar for all upcoming events. We, um, we change it uh, periodically. So now thank you to Gary Atkins Sound Systems, Sylvia Uribe Transil Pro for simultaneous Spanish translation. If you would like to hear the presenters in Spanish, please ask her for headphones. And thank you to our TV Santa Barbara crew and JP Montalvo, who is in charge of this production. And we will be stream, uh, live streaming this event via Facebook. So if you have to leave early, uh, you can sit at your desk and, and uh, live stream it. And after this forum, a few days, uh, after a few days, we will have both the English and Spanish versions of the video. And that'll be on our League YouTube site. And um, let's see. And the TVSB will also uh, air it on Channel 17 and 71. So a big thank you to Peter Hasland and the Center for Global Dialogue for co-sponsoring and organizing this forum with our Social Policy Committee Chair, Pam Flint Tambo. Um, we, on, on, the, on the issue of criminal justice reform, the League has been working on this. Our state league has been encouraging all leagues to help uh, restore uh, and um, balance our, uh, and we've been doing education and advocacy too on criminal justice reform. And last year at our state convention, we adopted criminal justice reform as one of our five topics for emphasis in, uh, in the 2019-2021 term. So this is perfect for, for, um, for us because we currently have a statewide league task force working on criminal justice reform and Pam serves on that task force and we hope to adopt a position so that we can have a position in place for advocacy and education. Uh, and we will be uh, doing that at our US convention in June this year. Welcome to our distinguished panelists. We thank you for coming to share your expertise on this important topic. And today, after this forum, everyone is invited to a short reception um, in the back, we will be setting out uh, food. So please stay and interact with our panelists. Um, now I'd like to introduce my friend and collaborator, Peter Hasland, who will be moderating this forum. Peter is the founding president of the Center for Global Dialogue when it was formed in 2000, along with Lessie Nixon when she was with the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara. I served on the center's board uh, with Peter for eight years, and I was there when we first examined the high cost of incarceration, Scandinavian alternatives. That was almost three years ago. Dr. Hasland was born in Copenhagen, Denmark, and lived there during the German occupation. He immigrated to the United States in 1949 and became naturalized citizen in 1954. 
He served in the Air Force and then as Professor of Political Science and Global Studies at SBCC, the Santa Barbara City College, for 40 years, 4-0, and held adjunct and visiting professorships at UCSB, Shandong University in China, and Hanoi University in Vietnam. Peter retired in 2009 and was elected to the Board of Trustees for the Santa Barbara Community College in 2010. And he has been re-elected continually since then. So please welcome Peter Hasland. Wow, I didn't know half of that. <laughs> well, welcome all. It's nice to see you. I was kind of hoping people would show up, but I also had the parking problem, you know. I'd... Well, j just, just to, before I, I introduce our panel, I want to make a confession because I'm told that confessions are good for the soul, might even be good for the liver, I don't know. The confession is that the board of directors for the Center for Global Dialogue are rank amateurs. We, we're, none of us are lawyers, none of us are judges. We, we became interested in this because we are citizens. And in, in some way, that's really in keeping with the League of Women Voters' basic motto that democracy is not a spectator sport. It, in, it involves us all, and to some extent, some of the failings that I'd like to talk about of our criminal justice system derives from our failings. We can point fingers at specific people, but that doesn't work really, because it's really us. It's really up to us. And so what we have done is work very hard to try to come up with a set of recommendations that we hope make some sense and might have an impact on the system later on. I want to introduce um, First of all, I want to introduce my, my wonderful board of directors, some of whom are here, um, I think. Maybe not. Oh, yes. <laughs> Deb, Deb Arts is our secretary, and Carrie Payne is our treasurer, and Mary Jo, Mary jo is over here. Mary Jo is a member of our board of directors, recently returned from Rwanda, where she's been working as a nurse for many years. Um, so I'm, I'm blessed with people who really are interested and committed to, to actually examining what is going on with this issue. I want to introduce first uh, uh, retired Superior Court Judge George Eskin. That's George. And he was, a, he was a member of our first panel three years ago. And uh, uh, we'll want to introduce uh, Commander Robert Plastino from the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office. Met him the other day when we were engaged in, uh, in conversation about, uh, uh, about a, a, a proposal by Clue. And uh, uh, next is Christiane um, Schell, formerly incarcerated, somebody who actually knows the system from the inside and is therefore an invaluable member of our panel. Um, Maureen Earls is a member of CLU, or Clergy and Laity United for Economic Justice. And finally, Lisa Moschino, the Vice President and Clinical Director of Sanctuary Centers. I just learned from Lisa that I did a program on Sanctuary House. I, I did learn this, I remembered it quite well, but it was in the 1970s and somehow that videotape has found its way to, to their center. Let me see, maybe we should uh, dim the lights a little bit so you can see my, I have a, a slide presentation, but it's very simple. I, when I was a teacher, a classroom teacher, I really got enthralled with doing PowerPoints. And, and, and then one day, my student, one of my students came up and said, you know, it really takes away from the dialogue. And I, that was the end of it. So I, I use it very infrequently. But today, it may, it may be exceptional um, to, uh, to examine the high cost of American incarceration. 
Uh, I, I, I need to tell you how I got into this. It's quite by accident. I, I, uh, I had uh, a whole year off after, uh, after retiring in 2009, and I, I had lots of fun during that year. I, mostly I tutored on campus. I tutored international students, and that was fun. But then, uh, then I ran for office and managed to win. So I'm, you know, politician. That's me. And, and one of the first things I discovered, you know, as a, a member of the gov governing board of Santa Barbara Community College District, was our, our task is to find the resources with which to make sure that the educational process moves forward, and that the mission of the college is satisfied, that we educate the next generation as best we can. And we had a problem. We had a high failure rate among Hispanic students taking mathematics, and we couldn't figure out why. And so we, we did a little research, and we, we modified how we did that. I mean, 65% failed. That was terrible. So we reduced class size. We provided extra training for the faculty. We added mentors. We added tutors. We did whatever was necessary to ensure that they could learn. And within a very short time, that 65% failure rate was transformed to a 92% success rate. So we knew exactly what to do. We just needed the resources with which to do it. And so I started looking at the state budget for ways of finding money. And I looked for areas of waste. And I ran across this, this word, recidivism. And I think that's my next slide. Let's see if this works. Ah, I should have, I should have introduced. This, this is the mission of, our, of, of the Center for Global Dialogue. We, we have typically, and I'll get to recidivism, don't, don't worry. Uh, we, we have, um, typically, we just do one program a year, either here or somewhere else. And our mission has been to focus on uh, providing an educational process for the general public because we think citizens ought to be informed about global affairs, uh, because you vote for people who actually make decisions about global affairs. And that's, that's why we, we do what we do. Every, uh, every society uh, needs rules. Since the dawn of human society, we've, we've created a set of rules just to avoid chaos. And we do that because we, we have a responsibility to affect public safety. And with people who break the rules, um, there are consequences. The goals of uh, incarceration, among others, are these. First, to increase public safety. Second, to apply the punitive aspect. Third, and may, maybe, the, the, maybe the punishment also has provides some incentive to others not to do whatever it is that has brought this person to, to prison. So there, there, may be, there may be some some threat to the rest of us by having others receive their punishment. And the third is rehabilitation. We tried rehabilitation in the 1970s. Didn't work very well, in part because we didn't put much money into it. And so uh, politicians being who we are, uh, we, uh, we, we seize upon that, and, and we make simple that which is complex. And simple slogans like, three strikes and you're out, seem to govern how we were going to to uh, deal with the problem of, of criminal justice in California. Um, and the problem is it, it resulted in a substantial increase in the number of people who are being incarcerated, uh, prison overcrowding, and the like. And here is that, that word again, recidivism, that I discovered when I was a newly elected member of the Board of Trustees. Recidivism has to do with the rate of return of someone who is incarcerated and who graduates. He did his service, then he's out. And recidivism here is, 
is that we, we, we realize that 70% of those who are released from prison after serving their sentence go back in within the first three years. And that the cost to us as taxpayers is roughly $95,000 per recidivist per year of recidivism, per year of reincarceration, rather. And, and that's when I got the idea, hey, I, I could use those dollars to educate students. I got very enthused about it. Um, maybe I shouldn't have because it's not that easy to switch over. Uh, what I thought would be, uh, would be you know, a slam dunk, surely everybody will see this, hasn't been. <clears throat> Our project began three years ago. Uh, and, and, what we, and the reason we chose the Scandinavian model by which to compare what we did was that the Scandinavian model had a much lower rate of recidivism. Theirs was ranging between 20 and 26 percent. And that's, that's truly why. Our approach in, in doing our research has been to examine what are the aspects of change that we'd like to see before actual incarceration? Uh, what, are, what, are the, what is it that we want to see during incarceration? And what changes might we want to have happen once a person's uh, uh, prison sentence has been completed and they're released? So before incarceration, we, we looked at things like length of sentences. Uh, and uh, we, we found that very long American sentences, first of all, we're unique in the, in the fact that we have very lengthy sentences among countries of the world. And uh, we found that there was a disincentive. If you had a long, long sentence, were, would you be interested in being educated? Well, no. <laughs> 30 years is a long time to wait for me to get out and get a job using the educational skills that I've acquired. Uh, so we looked at that. Uh, we looked at alternatives to incarceration. Uh, it, it isn't necessarily the case that everybody has to go to jail. Uh, and we developed, we've, we found that the major variable in making these decisions about who goes to a, uh, a, a a tightly secured facility and who goes to a minimum security facility is some form of screening process that will make the distinction between uh, whether someone is at a high risk or a low risk of, of being violent or um, disruptive or being receptive to rehabilitation. So while we're looking at uh, uh, at, at activity during incarceration, what we really looked at was the possibility, the, the necessity for some sort of a fundamental cultural shift. It isn't just a cultural shift inside the prison. I think it is a cultural shift outside a prison. We have, to, we have to be able to see folks for who they are as human beings. They, they, lose, they lose something substantial. When they're in, incarcerated, they lose freedom. They're no longer able to go home at night. So the suspension of liberty in, in the Scandinavian form is what they really lose by being incarcerated. Uh, and in, in American culture, I think we, we emphasize the punitive at the cost of looking at the rehabilitative. And what we are going to be urging is more of the latter, less of the former that there, there is an effective method of rehabilitation. One shoe does not fit all. Different cultures will have different systems of rehabilitation. And that education and skills training is going to be absolutely essential if they're going to make it on the outside. <clears throat> After release, there's going to be an ongoing need for education. And there will be a, a need, that, I mean, the Sheriff Bill Brown is very, certain that one of the requirements, one of the requirements that's going to ensure and underscore success is getting a job. And if you don't get a job, you're not going to stay out very long. 
um, and family and community support. And uh, that would, that would, here we have to do a little work on, on the NIMBY factor that is not in our backyard. When pe people are released from prison, they need to be assimilated and brought into society once again. So that's, that's what we are seeking to do. We, uh, I'll, I'll add a conclusion having to do with whether the system is truly broken. We think, we think it is at least partially broken. Fault has to do with all of us. We are citizens. We have an obligation to know what's going on and to respond to those who are elected to make our decisions. Um, we're, we're putting together a paper, and part of the reason for today's session is to learn. We want to learn from you. We want to learn from our panel. And the goal is to put together a better paper that will reflect some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today. My hope is that we can have a conversation. Several of our panel members have prepared statements, and we'll, we'll work through those. But then let's have a conversation. And the tradition of the Center for Global Dialogue has always been that about half of our time is allocated to audience participation. So we really want your participation in this, in this uh, dialogue. So with that, can I turn it over to George? Yes. To start? Yes. <laughs> George Eskin has the distinction of having just been released from jury duty. Can you imagine they, <laughs> they turned him down? And he's such a nice looking guy. I mean, <laughs> trustworthy. Are you going to continue to stand there? <laughs> uh, no. Yeah, okay. well, yeah, I think I will. All right. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Peter for inviting me. I um, want to thank the League of Women Voters especially for continuing this dialogue. And I'm so grateful that, to learn that it was one of its five top priorities. I didn't come to criminal justice uh, by accident. And I've been involved with efforts at reform for over 55 years as a prosecutor, as a defense attorney, as a judge. And uh, I think I, Peter had encouraged me not to uh, turn to my prepared remarks, but I think it may be helpful um, to put everything in a kind of historical context uh, because the past 55 years of my involvement has seen some incredible roller coaster changes, and all of the things that we're going to discuss here today are largely influenced by um, our culture and public attitudes. And that's why I think the dialogue is so important, to keep people exchanging thoughts and ideas and providing information about what's really going on. I, I come here this morning enthusiastic and optimistic uh, I come here today with high hopes, in large part because of the messages that were included in Governor Newsom's 19, uh, 2020 budget proposal that was released two weeks ago, and I'm going to refer to that, and also because that, that, that in terms of statewide. I'm not looking beyond California. I'm looking at California in terms of the criminal justice reform we can and have affected. And I'm also looking locally, and there's a great reason for, for optimism about Santa Barbara County, starting with the uh, CEO of this county who hired the retired undersheriff, Barney Malekian, and assigned him to criminal justice. Uh, I don't recall in my many, many years of experience in local government and as a public prosecutor uh, I don't recall ever a county administration taking such an interest in the criminal justice process and some of the dynamics. And some of the changes that have occurred in recent years include identifying as stakeholders people who've been previously incarcerated and engaging them in the conversation. Um, when, when I was on the bench and we would have uh, invite uh, stakeholders 
to come in and discuss about, discuss issues associated with the criminal justice process. The notion of having someone who is a real stakeholder, having been gone through the machinery of the criminal justice process, was outlandish. But I have learned as a result of my experience on the statewide Proposition 47 Executive Steering Committee to the Board of State and Community Corrections that previously incarcerated persons had the most valuable contributions to make to the dialogue to understanding what's right and what's wrong with the system. And another thing that's, that's uh, occurred recently is the inclusion of the De Department of Mental Wellness in discussions having to do with the criminal justice process. This, this was unheard of five, five years ago. And now we have Alice Cleghorn, who's involved with uh, the group that Barney Malekian has put together, along with our probation officer, a very forward, chief probation officer, a very forward thinking person who recognizes that identifying the root, cause, the root causes of the conduct that led to an arrest, that led to a prosecution, that led to a conviction, are the things that should be addressed at the outset, at the earliest stage of the proceedings. And going off my script, I'm way off my script, but going off my script even further is a recognition that we should be identifying in children the potential for antisocial behavior that's going to lead them from going to kindergarten to prison and try to deal with the underlying causes there in terms of mental health and other social issues, obviously poverty, other social issues that contribute to people engaging in the rule breaking that Professor Haslam referred to. So we have in this county a probation officer, a CEO, a district attorney, a sheriff, a public defender who are actively pursuing reforms and achieving significant progress in terms of recognizing that simply locking people up and throwing away the key has been the dismal failure that our history of incarceration over the past 60 years uh, has created. We, we had a series of celebrated homicides in the 1960s, the Zodiac Killer, the Charles Manson family, the Hillside Strangler, the Night Stalker, the Golden State Killer. We had a series of, of crimes that caused people to become very fearful, and the result was a prison population through the process of mandatory minimum sentencing and taking away from judges the discretion uh, to impose a sentence that was tailored to the defendant and the crime Suddenly, our prison population in 1977, which was 60,000, excuse me, 20,000 in 1977, jumped to 166,000 in 2006 because all of all these statutes and initiatives that we uh, adopted because of the thought that public safety means locking people up. Uh, in the past, nine years, going on 10. We've had some reforms that have been initiated by the legislature, Prop, 30, um, Prop 36. We had, uh, um, that was adopted in 2012. The voters adopted Prop 47 in 2014. Uh, the voters adopted Prop 57 in 2016. All of these returning some discretion to judges to tailor sentences to fit the crime and the, and the uh, uh, offense and the offender. Um, and as a result, over the last several years, the average daily state prison population has been reduced by 40,000. Um, the governor's 2020 budget proposal released last week and what I was enthusiastic and excited about recognizes that um, our prisons are extraordinarily expensive, extraordinarily non-productive, and among his proposals will be the uh, uh, elimination of one of the prison facilities in the next five years to accommodate the declining prison population. 
We've realized tremendous savings by terminating contracts with other states where we would send our prisoners. And this was a practice I have to confess, and I think I did this at our last discussion, I was unaware of until I discovered that a fellow I had, dis I had sentenced to prison for seven years was, was housed in Arkansas. I didn't know that. And I mean, I should have known that, but it, I think it's also a, a, a message of the lack of communication between the corrections folks then and the courts. And, but those, those options have been eliminated. Uh, we don't have prisoners in other states now serving their sentences, and they have access to whatever programs are going to be developed and have been developed within the state prison system here in California, as well as access to their families and access to their uh, job opportunities. But the governor's budget proposal also states that its administration is committed to improving outcomes for incarcerated persons and enhancing public safety by improving rehabilitation and re-entry programs. Re-entry is my key word. And, and I, this, the word rehabilitation somehow or other has never set well with me because number one, while we adopted it as a goal many years ago, we never invested the resources in making it happen. And rehabilitation also may be a misnomer because the people who are subject to the rehabilitation process may not be restored to something that they were ever enjoyed in the first place. So I think if we talk about reentry, as we learned in Scandinavia, that from the moment a person is incarcerated for an offense that requires incarceration, the whole focus is on the reality that he or she is going to be released from custody today or tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. And when they're released, will they be in a better position to adjust to the demands of society, the rules that we prescribed, and be able to lead a productive life? So the budget that the governor has proposed identifies these kinds of things that we have been discussing in terms of changes in the criminal justice system and invests a considerable amount of money in it. Um, the other reason for my enthusiasm besides the governor's recognition of this need for change is the fact that here in Santa Barbara, as I mentioned at the outside, we have a bunch of leaders now who are committed to making the system work and not simply having a system that depends upon locking people up, but preparing for their re-entry, preparing for their restored, being restored to active lives that are crime-free and requiring the kinds of temporary supervision that may be necessary to help people get and stay on the right track. Our probation department is overwhelmed with what we call banked cases. These are cases that get no supervision, no interaction with the, with the people who've been placed on probation, but rather they're just there in case during the extended period of probation, and that's another problem we need to address, five years, three years, two years. What's really required in terms of making a determination that a person has reached a stage where they no longer require supervision because they've been uh, the beneficiaries of treatment, of job training, of education, and of reintegrating themselves into the community in a positive way. And so I, mean, I believe we are uh, on the verge of very positive things happening in the state of California and in the county of Santa Barbara. A good Thank place you. to, good place to, to segue to uh, somebody who is. With one caveat. One caveat. We have to be aware of the caveat. November 2020 ballot and two initiatives that we should be concerned about. And this is something that League of Women Voters should be concerned about. One is an initiative initiated by Assemblymember Jim Cooper, which is called Reducing Crime and Keeping California Safe Act. And it's designed to roll back the uh, progress that Prop 47 has made. And the other is the Senate Bill 10 veto referendum, which is uh, put on the ballot by the bail industry. And that one is designed to overturn the legislation that did away with cash bail that was supposed to have taken effect 
in October, November of uh, 2019, but has been suspended because of the ballot initiative that will be uh, determined by the voters in November 2020. Well, thank you for the caveats. You, um, Rob uh, Plastino is um, <coughs> part of the, the uh, County Sheriff's Department, and he holds the rank of commander. And he, I, I had a good opportunity to meet him the other day, and we're, we're going to try to keep to four to five minutes for you each. I know. <laughs> Judge, you said it all. I would mean, you I, have? I really, would you have? <laughs> I think you stole my thunder a few times there, but no, it's <laughs> no, it's good. Um, and and I too am very optimistic, extremely optimistic. Um, as the judge said, you know, not just throughout the county, but within the sheriff's office, I've seen changes in leadership. Um, Sheriff Bill Brown is very, very forward-thinking, and he has implemented some changes within our organization already with thoughts of how we can go forward and, and make further changes. For example, um, you know, and, and it's not just, the Sheriff's Office isn't just involved in incarceration. And we're, we, we're out there out on patrol, we do patrol, and, and we've looked at, well, how can we change patrol too? I mean, maybe some people don't need to go to jail. Maybe they're mentally ill and they need to be taken to a facility to get treatment as opposed to being arrested. Um, and we formed a, what's called our behavioral sciences unit and within that is a co-response team that we've partnered with behavioral wellness and we have a, a partnership with them. They, they ride along in a car with a sheriff's deputy that's been trained in dealing with the mentally ill so that we can intercept them from being arrested and not put them in jail and get them into treatment. So there are things that we are doing already. If they are arrested though and they are brought within our facility, there are the thought that kind of has come to us over the last few years. And, and I have to say that law enforcement, like a lot of other government organizations, have done things the same way over and over and over for many years just because we've done it that way. And it's very difficult to change. Um, it's difficult to change people who have been trained to do it the certain way. It's difficult to change the laws and the policies that are involved in making it happen that way. Um, but we are seeing changes within California that are allowing us to make incremental changes within our own institutions um, for, for the better. And in our, in our institutions of um, incarceration, we've seen programs being brought in. We've realized that, as the judge mentioned, that um, who, do we, who, who is it that we're releasing out into the community? Are, we know that there are people that are, in, that are in jail, they're going to be released, we know when they're gonna be released. Are we creating a better citizen within our facility to release back out into the community? We have an obligation to help form that person, get them the education and training and skills that they need to do well out in the community so that they're a good neighbor to you. And we're starting to evolve and to change within our own institution in that way. We have. We have programs right now that will help inmates get their GED, get college credit. Um, we, and, and some of these things are difficult to do because we have to bring professors into the facility to do the training. And we are starting to get up to speed with technology. We're bringing in tablets where they can do classes online and their tablets. And if they complete classes, they get certificates. Um, we're training them in the food industry, so when they come out, they can actually get jobs in, in, in uh, you know, right out, right out, out the door. Um, we're, and we're tr but we don't have the social net outside the facility that we would really like to see. And a lot of the um, Scandinavian countries have these built-in social networks already to, to kind of, you know, once they get out of prison or jail, they get handed off to somebody and they get plugged in. And we don't quite have all of those things in place yet but we're building them slowly at a time. And I, I think that's very positive. That's why I'm optimistic about it. And um, you know, I'm, I'm really glad to be part of this panel. Thank you. Good, thank you. Chris, Christiane Schell has uh, the, the, you know, the, the benefit of having looked at this from the inside and is likely to be able to help us understand what that's about. Let's say I have a diverse education. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are a lot of things going well. There are things that work. There are things that don't. Um, I would like to point out that public defender in Santa Barbara County has a holistic defense program, which I think is phenomenal. 
And it's when I first heard about it, it's like, well, it's about time. It's okay, they're getting it. And Sheriff Brown is very progressive in his thinking. He, he is very supportive. He's very supportive of the, of the Day Reporting Center, which um, supports parolees, which I get the pleasure to work as their substance abuse counselor. I think um, it's important to have a job, but it's also important to know how to keep it. It's important to know how to manage emotions and understand anger. One of the things I've learned from being incarcerated is that my prison started long before I ever went in front of a judge, long before I ever came across law enforcement. It started long before that. So that incarceration and that mentality and that thinking started long before I had my number. It wasn't all of a sudden. It was something that built over time. So I like, yes, reaching out to the children, reaching out to the young adults and supporting them. There was something, a um, quote I came across the other day that just sat with me, and I wanted to share it with you. It says, it's impossible, said pride. It's risky, said experience. It's pointless, said reason. Give it a try, whispered the heart. And I think learning how to connect our hearts and our heads again is a key to rehabilitating and re-entering. We can have the job training, we can have the education, we can have all that, and those are all important pieces of the puzzle. But if the element is missing about with my head and my heart and how to communicate that, how to manage my own emotion, how to hold myself accountable compassionately, how to take responsibility without judgment or shame, when that piece is missing, Nothing else will fall in. Nothing else will work. I watched women coming. I was in prison for 18 years, and I watched them coming in and out. Every time they came, they'd get a new vocation. Great vocations. We can, we can weld. We had office services. We had all these things, but the emotional component was missing. There are organizations, and there's programs that actually help connect that mind and that heart, and they derive from Viktor Frankl and... Um, and he says, everything can pay, be taken from an individual, but one thing, their freedom to choose their response in any given situation. So when we learn that we have a choice in how we feel, that we have a choice in how we respond in that, that supports, that make, creates a foundation for everything else. I feel empowered to get that job. I can be okay when my boss talks at me. I won't respond in a negative way. What does that look like? when I can reinstill my humanity and realize I am a human being and I'm not just a product of my environment, or I'm not just this person who um, feels relieved when she walks into prison. That's how I felt. I got to prison and I felt relieved. That's a scary feeling. But I found a freedom in prison because of the things that I've learned and I think the things that do work, restorative justice, restorative practices, I think are key to everything because it teaches humanity. I learn your human story and you learn mine. And we can see each other as people instead of a police officer or a convict. We are human beings and we all have a story. I get the privilege of working with people who have been in prison and I am inspired every day I get to do what I love, and I get to love what I do, and I'm inspired every day by how hard these clients are working to make changes, and how difficult it is for them when they don't have the resources they need. Yes, we can get a job for $12 an hour. Great, you have a job, let's you know, applaud you. You no longer qualify for Medi-Cal, so you don't have any more medical insurance. They don't offer medical, and to live on $12, $12.50 an hour, it's, it's unrealistic. So that's self-defeating. It's like, okay, so where's the support? How do I upgrade? What do I do? But I think knowing that there are partners who are doing something to make changes, that we're talking about the human condition and not talking about the problem with criminal justice. It's a community. It's a human thing. It's an us thing. It's a we thing. It's not a them thing. I think that makes the change in these conversations. And I so appreciate you asking me to be here because I remember when you were here the, for, with the first panel and um, you're continuing the conversation 
that becomes frustrating when we have these conversations and we like, oh great, we get on this bandwagon and ooh who, let's go, and then nothing happens. I see you following through and I so honor and appreciate you for that, so thank you. I learned about the existence of Maureen Earls quite late in the game. Had no idea that there was another organization in Santa Barbara that was interested in this issue. And so I tripped over something called Clue. And I, I have to wonder, how many other organizations might there be that have a similar feeling, a similar conviction, and with whom we could be allies in pressing those ultimately responsible for making the changes. Maureen, thank you for being here. Thank you. Well, uh, I was thinking about uh, what to share of the vast amount of things we could discuss here today. And I came up with five steps that I think Clue uh, strongly advocates for if we want to do the right thing if we want to do the right thing for our Santa Barbara jails in order to begin to make progress, empowering jail residents to be free from crime when they're released. Martin Luther King says it's always the right time to do the right thing. So if we get the right thing in our minds, then it's time to do it. So my Clue works uh, in very practical ways to try and change systems. So mine will, comments, my five comments will be very practical things. The first is to recommend that, or advocate for our community and the Board of Supervisors to take action to empower the corrections to provide data each year to show we're making progress in reducing the percent of those returning to jail. We need accountability for millions of dollars spent every year in realignment funds invested in programs to reach that goal. But we have no data after eight years to show progress specifically on reducing recidivism in jail. It remains at an estimated 70%. Secondly, for our community, it's important, I think, to acknowledge the steps forward last year. Under the leadership of Kim Sheen, the deputy chief in probation, and with Gary Hart and other supervisors, um, for the first time, we used realignment funds to provide permanent supportive housing for those leaving or who are released from jail who are very vulnerable and they need support. $2.6 million invested in that housing is an important step forward. And it was the first time those realignment funds were ever used for housing. And we believe that it's an important model because we will be able to show that we did an intervention that then when we follow up with those people will show that they actually are not returning to jail because of that intervention. And that's a key, key concept and a key um, action that I think we need to keep looking at every time we make a, have a program. Is it really not just saying, well, we have more people in the program next year, but rather can we track those people in the programs and see that it's making a difference? Thirdly, um, I think the community and certainly Clue acknowledges Commander Rob here, here today and Ryan, who took the risk to collaborate with Clue in researching the Norway model of changing the punishment environment and culture in jail. And secondly, for their courage to ask the question, how can we implement this principle of normality? Instead of saying, oh, that's, Norman, uh, that's Norway, that's different culture. Ah, how can we do that in our jail here in Santa Barbara, change this whole culture? It's, it wasn't too big for them to ask that question. And thirdly, they took action 
and they actually uh, joined with, invited Clue to join with them in looking at a program that they're implementing in the jail, which is training the officers to move from watching a video screen of what people are doing in the jail to actually directly interacting with them. And it's that relationship with people that's going to make the difference in transforming the culture of the jail and resulting in a more, we believe, a more successful outcome. In Norway, as was mentioned here, um, I actually visited the prison in Norway, uh, Halden Prison, and their recidivism rate went from 70% like ours to 20%. And it, they did that in two years after implementing this cultural change in their jail. And so we have great hope that working with uh, Ryan and, and uh, Rob, that we can begin to build on that model that they're implementing in training and add to it these normality practices that we learned about from the Scandinavian model and then track that, um, uh, the results of that after post-release in, in those who participate. Um, thirdly, I mean fourth, uh, we are advocating for what we call a normality demonstration jail project. And what that means is um, it will be provide really valuable data on the process and results of working with Commander Ryan and these officers he's training and the 40 residents who are involved in that interaction. And so we can document, hey, what did we do to create that new culture, to create that relationship that is more impactful in helping them achieve their re-entry goals so they're ready to go out and be successful in a life without crime. And I guess most importantly that we will be able to, um, to document that because as long as we keep doing things and not documenting and seeing any difference, we're not really making progress. And finally, as this demonstration project succeeds, we advocate for exploring and designing a proposal to build a new demonstration normality jail here in Santa Barbara on property that's available in North County. I never thought I would be advocating for a new jail. Clue has never had that. We, we was always preventing people from jail or it was helping people after jail uh, release to have housing, et cetera. But after visiting Norway and really studying, we've done tons of research for, since August with Rob and Ryan and, and a committee, we're convinced jail is the place. Jail is a place that we can change the culture and we can enable people, we can empower them to go out and live successful lives without crime. And so, I, I just can't even believe I'm saying this out loud, but it's true. <laughs> it, it, it's really true. And, and uh, so we're very excited to begin that demonstration model with, um, with in, within the jail, and they actually, um, Commander Ryan is, has invited us to come and observe what's going on, to offer our, um, our understandings from the normality practices, and then to, to work together and then track what did we do and track afterwards what did it result in terms, what was the result in terms of um, these people not returning to jail at a much higher percentage. It's not a, a tough uh, standard. We have seven out of 10 returning 
to our jail, right? So if what if we just have 50% even, but we're going for you know the highest number possible. But anyway, th those are the things, very practical things that Clue is doing in, in conjunction with and collaboration with um, the uh, Sheriff's Department, particularly with the two commanders. And um, we're excited about the changes that can bring for Santa Barbara. Just be to to um, to interject here before we move on to Lisa. Just the, the concept, the Nor Norwegian concept of normality, is expressed a little differently in the Danish experience. I had a chance to to uh, well, I went to Denmark a year and a half ago, and I I was admitted to prison. I had <laughs> that was that was a unique experience. Uh, because I wanted, I wanted to be with those who were inmates, and I wanted to learn from them w how they felt, and uh, and I met with the general architect of the Danish, and for that matter, the Norwegian prison system. His name is William Rehnquist. Um, he uh, he said we asked two questions. In in and and their goal is to minimize the difference between being on the inside and being on the outside. Uh, he said, we asked two questions. One is, how would they do whatever it is that we're thinking of doing on the inside? How would they do this activity on the outside? And the second question is, is there any reason we couldn't do it exactly that same way on the inside? All of which is designed to lower that distinction between being on the inside, being on the outside. It returns, and a key element of this concept of, of uh, normalcy is uh, that it retains, uh, it retains dignity. Just because somebody is incarcerated, they've made a mistake, they're deprived of their liberty, they don't have to also be deprived of their dignity. I think that's a major part of it. Um, Lisa Moncini is the... <laughs> Moschini, I'm sorry, Vice President and Clinical Director of Sanctuary Centers. Uh, thank you very much for inviting Sanctuary to this table. Um, and I also want to thank the League of Women's Voters for continuing the dialogue. This is such an important uh, situation, and it, it does deserve this type of attention. And I don't think that it's gotten its attention, though I can say that in the time that Sanctuary Centers has been in the jail. We went into the jail in uh, December 2015, and we've been there every week meeting with incarcerated males who are suffering from substance abuse or addiction issues coupled with mental health issues. And it really was uh, the brainchild of Katie Ward and Tona Wakefield and a couple other people who really helped us to get into the jail and start this process. We didn't know how it was going to turn out. We just knew that what we wanted to try to do at Sanctuary was to bridge a gap between those who were incarcerated and then just being released to the streets oftentimes at very odd hours of the mornings and the evenings, with no way to get to treatment, with just a name on a piece of paper or a card, and no relationship built. So we thought, well, let's see if we can get into the jail on a weekly basis. We can work with the COs. We can work with the individuals that are incarcerated. And let's see if we can break some recidivism. And even if we make the difference with one individual or two individuals, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing for the jail to not have to house a mentally ill population with addictive issues? Uh, the program was called BRACE. It's called Breaking Recidivism and Creating Empowerment. And we have been in there, um, as I said, starting in December 2015, and we're there to this day. One of the things that um, uh, uh, Judge Eskin had said was that how would it feel to have your liberties taken away, your freedoms taken away, being placed into a jail cell, coming out one hour a week, two hours a week, three hours a week? I think to everybody in this room, it would be both frustrating and repugnant. But what people don't really recognize is that there are some individuals that go to jail for that structure. They have meals, they have health care, they have showers, they have a place to sleep. They have company, they're not lonely. 
And when we went in there, what we have found in the four years that we've been there is that the biggest obstacle for recidivism is finding housing. If you do not have a place to live, how are you going to have a job? How are you going to apply for a job? How are you going to get that job? How are you going to keep that job? How are you going to form relationships um, with whether it's service personnel or just even individuals that live in the community? And so a lot of our work while we're in the jails is really about where are these individuals going to live when they get out and helping them secure sober living environments or helping them secure other kind of living um, shelters, missions. Um, we've been moving around the jail for four years and we've finally landed in one spot that we have found is individuals that we can serve in our community, and oftentimes individuals that we have served and have been incarcerated over and over and over again. And um, when you can get an individual housing, then you can start to seek for the job. Then you can also start to work on what Maureen was talking about and what Christiane was talking about, which is really healing that individual. Um, so much of this, it, it's not just medications. It's having your identity. It's, it's, it's believing in who you are and what you can do with your life and, ha and looking at another individual and having them nod back to you that you can do this and we're gonna help you through it. And if you can't get there, we'll walk you there. And if we can't walk you there, I'll find somebody to drive you there. And we'll follow up for you. Sanctuary Centers is dedicated to helping not only the incarcerated individual, but the individual who's been marginalized and stigmatized. And we have partnered, and we've been lucky enough to partner with wonderful people, certainly the people in the jail, the COs, Commander Sullivan, Sheriff Bill Brown. We have been lucky enough to have those individuals as part of our partnerships. But we also have partnered with other individuals in the community. Those are the sober living homes. Those are um, programs, CADA. Those are Be Well, our county. And of course, uh, working with neighborhood clinics is another one where we can provide free psychiatry to individuals coming out of the jail. And we've been doing that now for about a year. And so we're trying to find through our work at Brace and in the jail where things fall apart when an individual leaves that jail. Um, I also wanted to touch a little bit on what Judge Eskin as well as Maureen Earls had, had stated, which was, uh, and Christiane, which is really reaching individuals in childhood and in young adulthood and in adolescence. I think one of the most amazing things about living in Santa Barbara County is the infrastructure that we already have. YouthWell is an amazing program that works with these individuals, that works with children and adolescents in the schools and after school. And these are areas that we can broaden their scope and our scope. And we as Sanctuary can join with other mental health professionals to fill that gap because we have the experience working with an incarcerated individual. Let's catch them before they're incarcerated. We do that for mental health. Why can't we do that for in individuals with addiction? And lastly, I, um, when Maureen came and spoke with me about Clue and about what they were doing up here in this panel, she asked for, you know, do we have any data to support what we've been doing at Brace and what's happening after Brace after four years? I said, we've got data. So <laughs> we, we like data. Now, there is some data that is missing because I think that everybody that knows statistics, you can skew statistics pretty simply by just not s defining what you're defining. Mm -hmm. um, and we have recently met with uh, the probation department, uh, Kim specifically, to talk about our um, outcome performance measures to measure specifically recidivism. because. In the statistics that I'm going to give you, the recidivism that we have here of graduates that did not return to the, to the jail is only what we know. The uh, probation can look and see if that person has been picked up in Ventura County or has left the county and is now in Las Vegas or somewhere. We don't have that. We, so this statistics, I just want to mm -hmm. uh, uh, let you know, only comes from individuals that we know have not returned to us and to our knowledge have not returned to the jail. Because generally when they do return to the jail, they return to a very specific dorm or housing market. So. Um, in the four years that we have been in the jail, we have seen and worked with 192 inmates. 
And of those 192 inmates, 18 people were referred to us. I know that's a really small number. I wish it was bigger. And I think that it will get bigger over time. A lot of the clients that we meet with, well, client inmates, that we meet with don't get released to Santa Barbara. Some of them get released to uh, Lompoc or Santa Maria. Others go off to prison. Others go to a state hospital for competency hearings. So again, as we started out through these four years, we were meeting with people that we knew would not turn into a referral base, but we were hoping that we could help the, the jail as well as the uh, COs. But of those 18 people that were referred directly to sanctuary centers in Santa Barbara, um, and this is between uh, January 2016 to November 7th, 2019. 18 people were referred to us in that time period. Eight people graduated from our program and graduated being defined by, they completed our aftercare program and they did not return to the jail and they have not returned back into our program for help or assistance. So we've moved them on to jobs, sober living environments, families, other healthy pursuits. Four individuals of those 18 still remain working with us at sanctuary centers in our outpatient program, our co-occurring disorder program, as well as our mental health program. And the other six were discharged unfavorably. They either went back into the jail or they never arrived, which we're finding one of the bigger issues. They didn't arrive for their intake. And so we're working with our community partners. So. Um, you know, I guess in ending, I, I feel honored to be up here with this panel um, and these individuals and to help in any way that Sanctuary can, and we're dedicated to this process, and we look forward to more panel discussions and uh, more movement forward. Thank you. It's, it's time for some questions from you and from you. Uh, you, you may have questions of each other, I don't know. I uh, questions of the audience. And, and then we'll have some questions from the audience. How many, Chris, can, how many of you do not understand or know what Christiane was referring to when she talked about, when she mentioned the public defender's holistic defense? <laughs> how many of you did not? That just kind of, all right. Well, let me explain that to you because it may provide opportunities for some of you. Um, I go back to when I went in, first went into private practice in the early 70s um, and was representing people charged with criminal offenses and a prospective client would come to my office and tell me his or her story and say, what are my chances of getting off? That was the phone. How can, I, how, can I, how can I avoid the consequences of my conduct? Uh, and I, I asked, well, what do you mean, in terms of percentages? And they said, well, yeah, the guy down the street said, I have a 70% chance of beating the rap. And I said, well, you mean if I say I can give you a 98% chance of beating the rap, you'll hire me? And yeah. I said, well, first of all, 90% of all people charged with criminal offenses plead guilty. 90% of all people charged with criminal offenses are convicted by their pleas. The job of the criminal defense attorney is not to get the client off. The job of the criminal defense attorney is to minimize the punitive consequences of a conviction and maximize the therapeutic consequences of a conviction. That's holistic defense. The question is not how can you beat the rap, the question is, why did you engage in the conduct that resulted in your arrest in the first place? Let's find out what that was. Was it because you were unemployed and hungry? Was it because you are addicted to drugs? Was it because you have a mental health problem that you should address? Is it because you are, don't lack the job skills to, to be employed? That's a holistic defense, finding out what it is that caused the conduct that broke the rules that led to an arrest. And, and our public defender has introduced that as almost an institutional policy for her department and has employed people who are geared to find out what it is that this client needs to get on with his or her life. And the reason I mentioned it to you in this context is I think there are opportunities for you 
for everyone who has an interest in this to contact the Public Defender's Office, Tracy McCuga is her name, contact her office, contact the holistic defense people, and see if there are opportunities, because what they're lacking, if anything, are resources to get people into programs, to get people into housing, to get people into education and, and job opportunities. So if you have some thoughts about volunteering, there is a place where you can make a difference. I would encourage you to do that. Comments from others? Um, yes, I have a, I'm sorry, I have a concern that's coming up that I need to share. Um, Santa Barbara County is doing amazing things, like we talked about holistic defense and CLUE. I mean, there's amazing things happening here. We have Sheriff Brown to support that. I'm concerned because I think it gets a little diluted with we have the jail population, which is county, but then we have a prison population, which is state. And they are two different things. And I work with a population who is state parolees and so many of the programs and things they are they do not qualify for it's AB 109 or it's probation or it's county it's not state so i have clients who have the same needs but aren't getting the services and so one of my concerns is is that we do talk about the jail and what's happening here in Santa Barbara which is great you're setting an example but we initially started with talking about prison and prison reform and how to change that. And then it kind of gets a little diluted down the road. So I just want to represent my prison peeps. You know, there's, <laughs> hey now, you know, it's, it's when we talk about justice involved individuals, let's not leave some of them out. Because then we are kind of going against everything we're trying to do. Let's say, Okay, justice involved individuals includes everybody, and how do we serve them equally as respectfully and not because somebody's up in Chowchilla, 400, 300 miles away, or just right around the corner who they're gonna be walking into my neighborhood tomorrow? You know, either way. So, how do we encompass all of it and give that kind of support and attention? Thank you. Questions from you? Let's see, way back there, we have. Near, and please speak into the microphone. Hi, um, my name's Anastasia Stone. Sorry, I'm gonna try to stand up a little better. Um, I'm actually the mother to five children, three of which I adopted through foster care, and one of which has dyslexia. Um, since you guys know statistics, you might know where I'm going with this. Um, when we talk about prevention, you kind of mentioned mental health issues with children. But what I'd like to address is that our educational system is actually failing our children, which is feeding our prison system, specifically with dyslexia, which we know from some limited studies that have been done. Um, so it's a little personal for me, because I worry about it. Um, as a mom who's pretty feisty, I fight for stuff and get things for my kid. But I worry about the parents who aren't able to do that, who don't have access, who don't feel like they can stand up. Uh, just for, sorry, I say things in stories. So when you go to an IEP meeting, if you've never been to one, as parents, you actually stand outside while the team gets together in a closed door room and you are left outside. Again, I said, I'm pretty feisty. Even myself, I feel like I am not as an important member of that team as everyone else in the room, even though technically my husband and I should be the lead of that team. So it starts way back here. My first IEP meeting was when my son was halfway through first grade. That's way early on. So I know that we're dealing out here, but I think the prevention starts way back there and dealing with our foster care system, which I know quite well. Um, and those are the things that I don't hear being addressed in depth, which is we can deal with it inside, but we won't get full change until we prevent it from happening. And when I say huge numbers, it's over 50% of the population is dyslexic, and over 50% of the population has spent time in foster care at some point. So I guess my question to you is, how are you guys addressing that problem? Anybody care to start with that one? I think the, the, the question is, and, and George alluded to it earlier on, you're, you're, the, best, 
the best possible outcome is not to go to prison in the first place, and how do we prevent that? And are there are there stages early on that can be taken, um, or steps that can be taken to prevent it? Well, I'm not qualified. I, I'm doing nothing. I mean, right up front, <laughs> and I'm really not qualified to discuss intelligently the issue that you've raised. Um, all I know is that I've spoken to teachers who claim that they can identify at a very early stage those kids who are headed down the wrong path. And the question is, can we as a society, can we as a community do something about that I intervention, I guess is a word that comes to mind, that will assist? Now, I've recently been exposed to the prospects of neurofeedback. And I was introduced to it in, in the context of we have a pilot program here in Santa Barbara County with people who are being released from prison and volunteering to participate in this neurofeedback project to see if through the neurofeedback process their brain waves can be trained to look at the world differently, to look at the world differently than they have in the past, can look at the world in the way people who are generally law-abiding, rule-following uh, uh, um, citizens can. Um, and my question was, well, if that's possible with the adults to retrain their brains, is neurofeedback something that can work with youngsters before they get in that area? Can those youngsters who are so easily identified, whether it's because of dyslexia or any other condition, can they be identified and assisted early on so that, that they can avoid the, the consequences of having their conduct misinterpreted or interpreted in the worst possible way? But I, I'm sad to say it's far beyond my expertise. Uh, I just think we need to continue to, to raise community awareness and interest and concern because that influences the policymakers. I, I want to give a shout out to Nick Welsh of the Santa Barbara Independent. He's constantly writing about these mental health illness issues. And I have to believe that um, our supervisors um, read it, our legislators read it, and they're influenced by it. And the more people can get behind it and, and articulate it and participate in discussions not just here, but in their communities, with their groups, with their organizations, with their families and friends, will move toward resolving that kind of problem, making people much more aware. I'm sure that um, uh, uh, Commander Plastino can tell us what law enforcement today, at least in the Sheriff's Department, being at least aware of the possibility that a person who is behaving in such, in a particular way, may uh, suffer from, if that's the right word, um, what it's not the right word, the condition that you that you described. Can I give like follow up? To that? No, and I, let's let's. I'd like to move on, and we have a question down here. Go ahead. Uh, I can talk without a mic. No, you need a mic. Yeah, we need a mic. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, I want to try to connect two things that were said today. I, this is one of the best public sessions I've ever been to. I spent years in New York State working on prison education programs and prison reform programs. The disjuncture that I see in what I thought was a terrific set of talks is that um, both Hesland and Eskin at the beginning noted that we've had a gigantic increase in the prison population between the 1970s and now, from uh, the number was 20,000 to 166,000. And it's been reduced by 40,000 since Prop 47. Fine, 20,000 to 124,000 or 126,000. Right. Okay. It's still an a, a absolutely gigantic increase. That increase is not because those people had problems. It's because the society has terrible problems and jailed them. There's simply no doubt. If you go down this wonderful reading list that the League of Women Voters has presented for today, you find that I think uh, six of the books are about jailing 
black Americans. Oh, yes. And no one has even mentioned racism in the incarceration system of the United States. Blacks are arrested more, they're convicted more, they're given longer sentences in almost, and maybe in every single state in the country. California led that revolution. I'm embarrassed to say as a native Californian who left for 50 years and has returned, but it's true. All of the reforms everybody's talked about today are absolutely wonderful, but they apply only to, as you said, Christiane Schell, thank you, to a very small group of prisoners who are released from jails, not from state prisons. And if you think it's bad in California, try Arkansas or even New York State. Yeah. Yeah. No. Thanks. You're, you're, you're quite right. But the paper does address that issue. The fact is that, that uh, African Americans constitute 5% of our national population and 25% of our prison population. And that, that there's no other way of ex expressing or defining why that happens uh, other than to use the, the word racism. And, and we need to address it. Yes. Uh, I have a couple things to say. Um, one is that I wanted to let everybody know here that there's an organization based here in Santa Barbara called the Freedom to Choose Project. It is the project that Christiane alluded to about um, we work inside the prisons. I've been working inside pr prisons, state prisons, for the last 15 years in large groups, 300 people at a clip. It is all volunteer driven. We have two staff people just of late. Um, we've done some research and what we found out, and this is working with the heart, mind, heart tools. And by the way, it's also got neuroscience techniques that we teach inside the prisons before people re release. Um, I worked in women's prisons for many years. I worked at Valley State Prison before it was, now it's a men's prison, it was a woman's prison. Um, first time I walked into a men's prison, I was shocked because in the women's prison, they wear um, like blue jeans and t-shirts. In the men's prison, they wear blue outfits that remind me of Nazi Germany. It says, CDCR prisoner, on your leg, on your arm, across your back. So who do you think you are? And, and you're the brothers in blue, as they call themselves. That was shocking to me in terms of how we see people. We don't see people. What we see is that label. Um, so. FreedomToChooseProject.org, it's here in Santa Barbara. With the little limited research we did, we found out that the women that did five of our weekend programs, we're there for two days, nine to three. If they've taken five of our workshops, the recidivism rate has dropped to less than 5% wow. versus the 49% that is the state average. And because of that success, the California De uh, Department of Corrections awarded Freedom to Choose um, grant money to go into two additional prisons. So if you're interested and you want to volunteer, freedomtochooseproject.org. Uh, okay. But what I also wanted to say about the kids and also when people come in is looking at trauma-based care or doing assessment of what's known as adverse childhood experiences. And um, just in, in having anecdotal stories with people, um, I talked to one woman, we both lost our dads when we were kids. So I'm saying, yeah, I was 11, my father had a heart attack. She said, yeah, I was four. And I said, wow, that's really young. She goes, yes, I was sitting on my father's lap when he got shot. What, I mean, those are the assessments that we need to do when people come into the system, besides their mental health, besides their other maybe learning disabilities. I used to teach remedial reading. I'm right with her about dyslexia, you know, but the childhood traumas, trauma-based care is a new buzzword in healthcare, but it needs to be a buzzword working in prisons and working from in schools 
because if you start dealing with the trauma that kids in inner cities and here in Santa Barbara live with that they are told not to talk about, we might have another way of trajectory to see, to divert them someplace else. Okay, so response that's it. from our, any of our panelists? Anybody care well, to? I, I would like to say my daughter's a teacher and I was a former teacher and, and we had on our clue board, Radley, uh, yes. And so she is doing mindfulness practices and classes in the schools in Santa Barbara. And I think there's a movement of, I mean, she has so much demand, she's hard to keep up training people to go into the classroom. So that's a good, a good sign, I think, that we're realizing the value of that connection between the heart rhythm and reaching that wisdom part of your brain that they have enough research on now. And I also know that in Peabody School, for example, where my daughter teaches, they have in-service on mindfulness in the very beginning as part of the in-service for the, for the teachers. And I also see that they have um, <clears throat> apps for young children. So when our grandchildren come, sometimes you can use those practices with them too. So there's this whole, whole mindfulness area that we can explore and develop as a preventative, and, and certainly all of us can use it, right? So. Any other question out here? By that, okay, back there. Good afternoon, my name is Elsa Granados, and I'm the executive director of Standing Together to End Sexual Assault. And there's an issue that, um, affects our agency, and that is Megan's Law. And Megan's Law requires that sexual predators register and that they um, cannot live within a certain uh, number of um, feet or, or distance from schools, from parks. And I agree with one of you who said that, um, that we, you know, one of the things that helps with um, in preventing recidivism is that stability of housing. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we have seen someone released in our community uh, and they can't find housing. Mm -hmm. And when Megan's Law was going to come into effect, we as a rape crisis center, as well as other rape crisis centers across the state, fought against that. And I got questions about why would you fight against something like that? And the reason is for what you have articulated in that I want to make sure that when a sexual predator is released in our community that they are, um, they have a place to stay, they have some stability, that they can find a job. Um, however, there's a balance that I think that our community seeks and that is their right to know. And um, Unfortunately, I think that Megan's Law gives us a false sense of security uh, because um, it tells us, well, you have three sexual predators in your, on your block or in your community, in the immediate community. And, but in any case, I'm wondering if any of you can address that sense about how we balance uh, the community's right to know or their sense of their right to know um, while at the same time still providing some uh, stability for those who are let out of uh, prison or jail? Um, Good question. I can, I can speak Lisa. to that a little bit. That's a very loaded question, as is the, the question about schooling and, and dyslexia and how those things impact um, you know, individuals' futures lives. Um, I, I am aware of Megan's Law, and there is no easy answer about how to change that. I know that when I was working up at Atascadero State Hospital, um, worked with sexually violent predators, and they were put in that hospital with uh, mentally disordered offenders. And so who did the, some of the sexually violent predators prey on? They preyed on the mentally ill. And so, you know, and they had the same problem. They had to get out. They had to... Uh, take care of Megan's Law. They had nowhere to live. They were all being released into the just the parks of Atascadero, California. So 
it's, a, it's such a large question. It's, it's, it's as large as talking about how to take what Norway and Scandinavia has done mm -hmm. so beautifully and bring that here and then pass that out and discussing jails versus prison, so many different, there's all these little nuances, but Atascadero State Hospital in California's response was to build a place up in Coalinga for the sexually violent predators, which is this gorgeous, amazing place, but nobody wants to work there, and it, there's nobody in it. There's like one little unit open in this beautiful facility, and so it's such a large issue I can speak to what happens in the jail, not the prison, but what happens in the jail with regards to individuals who are cold and they light a fire in a trash can and they get arrested for arson and then they go into the jail and then they go, okay, you have some mental illness, you made some really bad decisions, you were using drugs, now they're sober, now their mental illness is under uh, control and they have nowhere to live because nobody will take an arsonist. No, no sober living environment will accept an arsonist. And so this one gentleman in particular has been in and out of the jail probably about 157 times. Mm -hmm. I mean, just over and over. He gets released to the park, he goes back to the jail. He gets released to the park, he goes back to the jail. He's supposed to go to his probation officer, he goes to the park, he goes back to the jail. So it's a larger issue. It's not just for our uh, individuals um, having to register for Megan's Law. It's for individuals who are being charged with crimes. And the crime isn't looking, looked at in its totality. It's just looked at as the name. You lit a fire. Um, so, but there is no easy answer to that. I'm sorry. I, I love the work that you're doing. It's an amazing program and so well needed. But there's no easy answers. Other question? There's a question over here. Pam? Please ask in English. <laughs> uh, I was planning to do that. <laughs> so um, I apologize because my role here is as uh, an interpreter, but when am I going to get this wonderful panel again, <laughs> the opportunity to talk to you guys? I, um, I work at the district attorney's office too, and I am a victim advocate. So with all of these wonderful things that you're saying, I'm really happy to hear that we're thinking about the benefit of the whole community, not just the incarcerated people or anything like that. But the missing piece that I don't hear anything about is the victims. And um, I think it's going to be really difficult to have a balance between um, doing the right thing for incarcerated people when they come out and have the sense of safety for victims. Because every time that somebody gets released the victim of a violent crime, a victim goes like, oh my God, is that person go coming to get me? Oh my God. So I think that the voice of the victims needs to be heard too in places like this because that will give the other side to the story. It might be a good chance to talk about restorative justice if anybody would like to. Talk about what? Restorative justice. Oh. Well. Sylvia, you, you've identified, and the previous question, identified the reality that it's very complex, very complicated uh, issues that unfortunately we've tried to solve through the initiative process and legislation with simplistic fixes. It seems so simple. Sim we'll, we'll take a sex offender. You're, committed, you're, you're convicted of a sex offense, now you can't live anywhere. I mean, it, we, make, we make because we want to protect the victims um, from, future, from future offenses. Uh, and so public safety gets very complicated in trying to square it with our fundamental values in terms of, of justice and fairness and proportionality. Um, there, there is no easy answer. There is no easy answer. And this whole question of risk, this word risk has become very popular recently because the probation department is doing risk assessments of people in terms of whether or not they should be released prior to their being convicted of something and what is the risk of letting them out and what are the conditions that we should prescribe to reduce that risk. But there's risk associated with the release of anyone. And as judges, remember, judges are risk averse. 
They are risk averse. They don't want to take chances. They don't want to be held responsible for the fact that they released someone who went out and did something crazy, like going over to Las Vegas and shooting and killing 57 people. I mean, who could have predicted that? Well, it was a very low risk. But you don't need any risk. And the only way to deal with risk, if you don't want any risk, is lock everybody up. Lock everybody up forever. Well, that's not tenable. That's not tenable. So how do you determine who is going to be incarcerated before they're convicted, who's going to be incarcerated, and for how long after they're convicted, and what's going to happen with them while we have them in custody that's going to reduce the likelihood that when they re-enter, yeah. they're going to re-offend? Yeah. There are no easy answers. But the easy answers we've adopted in the past, Pat, 20 years ago, was lock them up and throw away the key and keep them there as long as we can. Add five-year enhancements. Add multiple enhancements. Then they won't get out until 2030 or 2040, but they're going to get out. I think that's a great question, so thank you for asking. Um, it's important to remember the victims, especially as someone who went to prison and was part of taking somebody else's life. It's important to, to recognize that. There's a part of, um, there's a population in prison that has been, they've been releasing more, and those are the lifers. Those are the ones who are convicted of vehicular manslaughters or 187s and other things. And there's certain things that a lifer has to do to get out of prison or to be considered for parole. And part of that is going in front of the parole board. And a huge part of that is saying, this is what I did, this is who I harmed, and this is what I'm doing differently, and this is my plan. I think not having something similar to that for everyone, not that you want to give everybody a life sentence, that's not what I'm saying. But it's, it's like a treatment plan and a treatment team, and I think accountability, compassionate accountability, is part of the rehabilitative plan. Restorative justice, recognizing the harm I caused, not just to my immediate victims, but my family was my victims. Anybody who crossed my path, who I lied and cheated, was my victim. Every time I stole drugs, got high, got drunk, drove down one of these stupid one-way streets under the influence, there was this potential for victims. The police, the judges, anybody who was affected by the choices I made was my victim. And restorative justice helps offenders recognize that in a way that's compassionate, that doesn't invoke shame. It's like, this is what I did. This is not who I am. And this is what I'm going to do differently because I can take 100% responsibility for my choices because now I know I can choose something different. This is how I'm making my living amends. This is how I acknowledge the people I had harmed. So I think there's such a low recidivism rate with lifers implementing some of what goes on with that, with general population, is I think hugely important. I think that's, that's a key and an element that I think needs to be looked at and reviewed. So thank you for bringing that up. Okay, question? Thank you. My name is Matt Lowe, and I'm coming from the perspective of restorative justice. My question is kind of focused more on the community level. So what do we need to transform in the community uh, to not allow the prison or incarceration rates to maintain or to increase? Um, the restorative justice perspective stands in that there's a, there's a victim or a person that has harmed the person who is harmed and then the community. And so how do we involve the community in one, the preventative measures, but also to the diversion opportunities that we allow our community to come together to create a different way of living together, whether it's implicit bias, any racism, um, creating solutions for dyslexia in our schools, um, having um, solutions for ADD in our schools, whatever uh, job opportunities that are um, going for our community, that keeps our community together before even being separated. Uh, there, there's a, in the restorative justice perspective, there's a saying that the punitive system is you do the time for the crime and the restorative process is how much healing for the harm that was done. And so how do we heal our, our communities? Because we can say that our incarceration rates for people of color are, or just um, black folks um, are 25% 
and we look at our communities, and the prison is just a mirror of what is happening in our communities. So how do we solve the issues before they even become um, what we're seeing in our prisons? And I, I think we really need to address the community level, whether it's you know, addressing school issues, implicit bias, or job opportunities. Um, there's, there's a healing that needs to take place in our communities. So what do we need to do um, to, to heal our communities? Excellent question. What do we do to heal our community? Yesterday or the day before when we were at, at the sheriff's office, uh, one of the speakers said something to that effect that the problem we are encountering is that th there's no place to release the former inmate where the community is going to be accepting mm -hmm. that person. So, it, it, so it, it, there's, there are two, two paths to that. I, you know, I think the answer lies in what you mentioned there, just community, right? What is, that, what is a community? It's, it's every aspect of our, you know, surroundings. It's law enforcement. It's, you know, the, the people that live next to you. It's the nonprofits that are in the community, the churches, synagogues, you know, whatever, whatever infrastructure you have there. And the only way that, you know, communities have to come together and work together and outside of government, you know, they got they to sit at a table together and try to determine what the issues are and how to tackle them and work together to solve the problem because no one person, no one entity has the answer. Uh, I worked in Isla Vista for a number of years and there was quite a bit of turmoil when I got there. And, you know, we used to have Halloween and Deltopia used to be huge major events. We had riots out there the, the, within six months of me arriving. And the only way we solved the problems that were going on out in Isla Vista was that we worked with everybody. Everybody came together, the student groups, the professors, the administration from the school, the businesses, the families that worked there. We all came together and we worked to solve the problem. And that's the only way to, to the solution. It's got, it's got to include everybody. Everyone, everybody needs to have a voice and everybody needs to come to the table to try to work towards a common goal. Other responses? Maureen? Well, I think, too, that to be realistic, if we're saying that seven out of 10 people leave our jail and will commit crime again, then how do we expect the community to feel safe when we release people and invite them in? That's reality. So if we can create like they do in Norway, you're talking to a person and they see the jail as a place that creates good neighbors when they come out. And that's, that's the common thing you would hear from someone. So we don't hear that here. And we need to have that as a goal in our jail to, hey, we're creating good neighbors as we exit people, we can show you the number of people who are not committing crimes because of all these things we're doing, and then we create a new climate of acceptance. But until we do that, it's asking a lot of a community, and myself as a mother or a grandmother, to you know, feel a sense of welcome to someone who has been incarcerated in, and um, it's entering the community. So, you know, it's not just ill-hearted people. It's like something we need to work on together. Yeah. Did you want to respond? No. I, I, just, I thought <laughs> you What do you want me to say? No. no. <laughs> I, I have a comment about that. May I? Sure. I think it comes down to communication and um, talking to people. I think as a justice-involved individual, you want honesty from me. You want me to say, this is what I've done, this is what I'm doing, and you want me to be completely transparent. So I think that goes with the community, too. I need you to tell me, I'm scared because. Let's have a dialogue. I need to know, we, the seven out of 10, mm -hmm. let's talk to those three who are successful and not focus on those seven that are still struggling. There's three people who are doing the dang thing. So let's honor them, let's have a conversation with them, but let's have this open dialogue. I need to know, if you're scared, Let's try to have a conversation, and that's what restorative justice is about. Let's see that humanity. Talk to me. I was convicted of a 187, a murder. If you're scared, you come talk to me, and I am completely open for you to work out whatever you need to do. I am available. 
because that's part of my living amends. I can accept it, and I can support you through that process mm -hmm. if that's something you're open to. So those three people out of that 10 might be in the same space. So now you have four who are willing to be here to support you and heal the whole instead of the one. Mm -hmm. Communications and restorative justice. I would add that in, in Denmark, the what surprised me most was that uh, in, in this country, uh, former inmate has to, uh, has to register in order to get a job, um, that, that he or she has been a, a, in prison. That's not the case in Denmark. You don't have to register, but you want to. You want to register because the prospective employer will know that because you have been in prison, you have undergone certain, certain changes and they can count on them, they can depend on them. You've gotten, you've acquired specific skills and you've acquired a sense of self-discipline and that matters. So in, in some way, it also depends on the, 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 the kind of preparation you have for life on the outside. Other question? Yes. I don't know the answer, but I'm thinking you might know. In California, are there any privatized prison systems? I know that's something that we haven't talked about, but we're focusing we're on. We're away with them. Yeah. Yes, we are. We've done away with them in California. Well, we are doing We're in right. the process. Because that also, to me, like you said, the bail industry, that's also part of the bigger mass incarceration problem. It's big business. No, but, but the governor's prescribed that it's not going to be big business after 2022. Well, I appreciate that about our state. And, you know, I'm glad that I live here, but my heart breaks for those who are victimized by people coming in and making money off their backs. But I'm glad to know that about our state. Thank you. Every, every, whenever I hear the word release, release, release from custody, I think back about the experience in Scandinavia. Um, one, of the, one of the problems that was identified uh, to us by a um, correctional official was the problem of a person being released on Friday and not having contact with the person to whom they're going to report till Monday. What was going to happen over the weekend? And they, that was a problem because there had the national organization and the local organization. And so that was their big problem. And I think about release in terms of what can be done to, to help heal. In our community, I'm thinking of the issue that was identified some years ago with someone being released from our jail at 3 o'clock in the morning out on Kai Real and nowhere to go. Um, and there was a hue and cry, and, and I don't know how it was resolved. I think the sheriff's department at the time explained why it was necessary to do that practice. But it seems to me that in terms of community coming together, we've got the faith community and all of the churches and temples and whatnot that have a commonality there. We've got our, we've got our um, Lions and Rotary and Kiwanis and and service club organizations, lots of other organizations, Junior League. I mean, you can go on and on here in Santa Barbara, and it seems to me that, that the League of Women Voters ought to encourage those organizations to address those kinds of problems in terms of volunteerism. If somebody's being released from custody at, out on Cai Real at 3 o'clock in the morning with nowhere to go, wandering around, disappearing, being abducted, God knows what, why aren't our organization, some of those that I identify, coming together to provide somebody to meet them and pick them up and take them somewhere. Um, I don't know that the probation, you know, somebody ought to be able to coordinate this. But that's the kind of community involvement. We've got to get people who have a commonality of interest to get together and see what they can coordinate to deal with these kinds of problems of reentry, helping people if probation's not there, helping people make their connection when they're released from custody that's going to take them to their next step to a, to a productive life. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to thank our panel. They have done a magnificent job, and I have, I have learned a lot, and I hope you have too. 
And my hope is that you will, you will render some help. The, the, my goal is to finish this paper and send it on to our representatives in Sacramento. But I need your help. And if you think that there's something, I mean, obviously, we couldn't cover everything. We did not even begin to touch the socioeconomic origins of, of some behavior that the rest of us find terrible. But there is that. There is that that hidden thing. There are educational opportunities that should be available. There are any number of aspects of this that we did not mention. Uh, if, you, if you will, send me an email. My email is right there. Um, or, or drop me a note in the, in, in the center's uh, mailbox and, and, and help us put this final thing together. And please know that you, you are not alone, we are not alone, there are people, there are groups like this happening all around the country, and so it is changing. So I think we are on the right track. Thank you very much for coming.